Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rupali LeMay. I'm the Deputy Director at the International Vaccine Access Center at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health. We are very excited about our webinar today, which is titled The Value of Vaccines Across the Life Course, a Showcase of Global Findings. If we can go to the next slide, please. So in line with World Immunization, Week 2022, the tagline is Long Life for All. And taken from the WHO website, one thing that this theme is focusing on is this idea that vaccines provide opportunity as well as hope for all of us to enjoy a more fulfilling life. And that's something that we should all be fighting for. Vaccines in the pursuit of a long life that is well lived. And so in line with this theme, we are going to have four presentations today. The first will be COVID-19, preparing early adopter countries for maternal vaccination demand generation. Formative research preliminary findings from Kenya. This will be presented by Alicia Paul and Paul Munyao. Next, we will move to understanding the HPV vaccine introduction landscape, challenges, facilitators, and indicators for decision-making. This work will be presented by Nayab Wahid and Dominique Guyam. The third presentation will be COVID-19 vaccination among the elderly, and this will be presented by Danny Feiken. And finally, we will end with Immunization Agenda 2030, Life Course and Integration, and this is presented by Laura Nick Lucklane. In the interest of time, I will not spend time introducing each of our esteemed speakers today. Each presentation will be 10 minutes long, which will allow us to have about 20 minutes for questions. Please feel free to include things in the Q&A function if you would like to ask a question, and we will try during the discussion time to get to your question as we can. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to the first set of presenters. Uh, Paul, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'll be taking this with Alicia, and uh, this is what Rupali just said, uh, project on COVID-19, preparing uh, early adopter countries for maternal vaccination, uh, a formative uh, study that was done in Kenya. Next, please. And uh, it's very clear that uh, pregnant and lactating women were actually excluded from uh, vaccine trials early on. And despite the fact that um, you know, they suffer even more from the disease, including their um, illness, plus even the pregnancy outcome. With this in mind, we examined the factors influencing uh, vaccine decision process for COVID-19 vaccine among pregnancy and lactating women so that we can be able to inform demand generation strategies. Next, please. Uh, we conducted the study in three counties of Kenya, uh, Garissa, which is a eastern county, uh, rural essentially Nairobi, which is a capital city of Kenya, um, but in central Kenya, um, where we did that eight uh, interviews and Kakamega, highly populated county in the western part of Kenya. And we did 32 interviews, and Kariza, sorry, we did 34. We did a qualitative <clears throat> uh, study using IDIs, interviews, uh, focusing on pregnant and lactating women, uh, community members, essentially male family members, community uh, gatekeepers, health workers, and policymakers. In this presentation, we will not be presenting the views of policymakers uh, as of yet. Next, please. Uh, we used um, the IDIs and we developed them through a team approach, the team in the US um, and the Kenyan team. And we did pretest uh, in a county that we had not been selected for a study. And we did that with five pregnant women. And the tool focused on the role of um, community, the community response of COVID-19 and vaccination experience. It also included uh, questions related to vaccine decision making process, which included knowledge, risk perception, social norms, uh, information sources, facilitation, and barriers. Thank you. I would like to hand this over to Alicia, please. Thank you, Paul. 
Uh, so to conduct our data analysis of this study, we used a grounded theory approach um, conducted by a team of seven researchers at the International Vaccine Access Center. Uh, and we used an iterative approach to develop our code list over three rounds of open coding. We coded about 25% of our transcripts and then identified our emerging themes and then shared these findings with our team um, with Japaigo. After coding uh, the remaining 75% of the transcripts, we identified our main themes and sub-themes, and we conducted an iterator reliability test and had a reliability of about 90%. Thank you, next slide. Okay. We present our findings using the SAGE vaccine hesitancy model, which organizes the determinants of vaccine acceptance into three groups, contextual influences, individual and group influences, and vaccine and vaccination specific issues. Next slide, please. So starting with contextual influences, we identified three themes here, including myths, interpersonal norms, and religion. We found that participants across all of our audience groups uh, reported several misconceptions about the COVID vaccine. Uh, some of these included the belief that the vaccine would cause infertility or that the vaccine was developed with the intent to control or reduce the population. Uh, we also saw that pregnant women in particular uh, believed several misconceptions about the negative effects the vaccine might have on their pregnancy. For interpersonal norms, we found that pregnant and lactating women are uh, influenced in their decision making by other women in their communities and also by uh, the opinions of their male partners. Uh, and the uh, influence that we saw of male partners on this decision making process was prominent across several of our uh, participant types. Uh, and one um, family member in Nairobi uh, exemplifies this. Uh, he says, my pregnant wife, she too is following what the community is saying. But I told her if the vaccine is being given, then you must receive the vaccination because all public servants are being given. Uh, in terms of religion, uh, some healthcare workers reported that uh, the influence of religious practices could be a challenging obstacle if there are beliefs against maternal vaccination. Um, however, we also saw reports that religion could be used as a useful tool to disseminate information as religious leaders could be um, an often trusted source of information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for our individual and group influences, we identified three themes here, including vaccine safety, risk perception, and the role of the healthcare worker. We found that vaccine safety was the most commonly reported concern for vaccine decision making across all participant groups. Um, for pregnant and lactating women in particular, uh, there was a large fear of side effects, uh, and pregnant women also reported a fear that the vaccine would cause um, harm during pregnancy, either to herself or to her baby. For risk perception, we found that pregnant and lactating women generally viewed themselves as particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 and saw the vaccine as a way to protect themselves and their babies. Uh, one pregnant woman in Kakamega exemplifies this. She said, uh, for me, because I'm a pregnant person, I think they should introduce vaccines for pregnant women because we are most vulnerable to contract the disease. Looking at the role of the healthcare worker, we found that they were often looked to for advice and trusted uh, by community members and pregnant and lactating women. However, um, reports from healthcare workers themselves uh, showed that uh, they often uh, displayed some inconsistencies in their recommendations and their own vaccine behaviors. Um, and they also reported some confusion among what they should be uh, recommending to their pregnant and lactating patients. Uh, next slide, please, and I'll pass it back over to Paul. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Um, vaccine and vaccination issues came up, and uh, these were um, issues like availability, accessibility, and eligibility. Um, on on uh, availability, this health worker from Kakamega was in a facility that was not offering uh, vaccination, and she found it actually very hard to convince clients that the reason why the facility is not providing vaccination. Um, uh, clients would think that the facility is hiding something from them. Uh, in terms of accessibility, um, 
the Croatian woman in Nairobi wished to see Pazdin brought door to door uh, so that people can really access them. And the health worker of Nairobi was very clear in that, you know, to say that Kenyans are hapless, um, working very hard to put their food on the table, and is not the kind of people want to queue from 8 to 4 p.m., you know, just to get uh, vaccinated. So the suggestion here is to have many vaccination points so that, you know, access would also be easy. Uh, in terms of eligibility, um, we saw that uh, one of these pregnant women said she, it's not even clear to her either. She, does, she hasn't been told anything, and uh, she doesn't know if she's actually supposed to take the, the vaccine herself. And then um, at the bottom of the page, it's a health worker um, who was saying also it's not clear to them, you know, um, whether they should recommend uh, the vaccine to the pregnant women um, as, as such. So let's go to the next uh, slide, please. And under here are the recommendations, and we'll just look through quickly based on those um, results. One important thing is actually to focus on information for healthcare workers, which pertains, you know, related to vaccine risk and benefit, so that um, we can be able to, as health workers can be able to engage in this very difficult uh, discussion around agency with clients, as well as agency with health workers themselves. And so, so as also to, to strengthen the trust between healthcare workers and their managers or their leaders. The other thing is really to engage um, the, the society, the society network, uh, especially the family members, uh, more especially men, uh, you know, uh, through community education, so as to gain support for vaccination during pregnancy. Um, and that is actually also uh, been mentioned by Baleta Etal and Usman, and as well as to increase community awareness. <clears throat> the other thing is issues of accessibility, as you saw, addressing last minute, uh, last mile issues, access issues, uh, so that <clears throat> there could be more points for vaccination, people do not need to queue. Uh, these vaccinations can be in local health centers or homes or offices so that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, clients can access without strain. The other point on communication is really addressing issues of pregnant and lactating women, especially their concern, um, but also ensuring that there is trust building um, that that focuses on relationship uh, building as well. I want to hand over now to Alicia once again. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And next slide, please. Um, so these uh, these results are limited in several ways. Uh, one is uh, the cross-sectional study design. Uh, we have to look at the context in which these data were collected. Uh, in Kenya during this time, uh, COVID was declining. And during this time, we also saw that the Ministry of Health um, changed the recommendations for eligibility of the COVID vaccine for pregnant and lactating women. And so our findings are not generalizable outside of this context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, with these results though, we do have several exciting next steps. Um, and that is to work with our communities to uh, in which we collected these data to um, uh, design and test and refine some communication strategies. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, uh, I know we're out of time, but I'd like to thank um, the following um, entities that are presented on this slide. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Alicia and Paul. Um, uh, we appreciate hearing a little bit about some of the demand generation and communication related to pregnant women and, and vaccines. Please do, I know uh, several people might have their hand raised. Please do include your questions in the chat. We will have time for discussion. But for now, we're gonna keep uh, the presentations moving. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dominique as well as Nayab to talk to us about HPV. Thank you, Rupali. So me and Dominique are going to study that we conducted on understanding the HPV vaccine introduction landscape, and that also includes challenges, facilitators, and indicators for decision-making process. Next slide. So a brief background. Cervical cancer is a morbidity and mortality among women in low and middle-income countries with approximately 90% deaths 
occur in low resource settings. The availability of and licensure of HPV vaccine in 2006 altered the landscape for prevention of cervical cancer and also led to the call by WHO for elimination of cervical cancer globally. The report for HPV vaccine is 9 to 14 years old. Next slide. In terms of introduction, over 85% of high income countries are already in HPV vaccine into their national programs, whereas only less than, nine, uh, less than 25% of low income countries have introduced HPV vaccine into the national program so far. Accelerating access in low middle income countries require understanding of decision making process for HPV vaccine introduction, as well as challenges and facilitators to introduction. The WHO global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer is 90 70 90 targets, and 90% of the girls are fully vaccinated by the age of 15, and um, uh, women screened twice by the age of 35 and 45 and 90% of the positive cases are treated. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, you just have to go one before. Yeah, this, uh, this specific objectives for our studies were to describe stakeholders' perspective regarding challenges and opportunities facing decision-making for HPV vaccine introduction and scale up in Gavi eligible countries. Next slide. So the first step for our methodology was a country identification, and we followed logic mapping to cover each region in Africa and Asia that included uh, certain parameters, such as introduction status of the country, programmatic diversity, if for instance, if they have single age cohort or multi-age cohort vaccination or which the type of delivery strategy that they're following and the delivery schedule. We also took geogra geographical consideration um, uh, to ensure that there's a representation of different regions within the continent. Next slide. Uh, the next step was stakeholder identification, and we identified stakeholders at the global level and at the national level. Global stakeholders included academic institutions and global immunization partners, whereas national stakeholders included Ministry of Health and different NGOs at the country level. And so far, we have completed almost uh, 30 interviews. Next slide. Some of the themes covered in the study were decision-making process, vaccine prioritization, HPV vaccine introduction, delivery, impact of COVID-19, and scale-up of HPV vaccination programs. Next slide. I will discuss briefly decision-making process and challenges to decision-making process at the country level. Next slide. Um, so I divided this into four steps, decision-making drive, which is either uh, country-driven or globally driven. And once this has been uh, spoken about, the next step is evaluation. So use the Ministry of Health, discuss with the relevant stakeholders and bring forward the agenda to NITAC. Uh, this follows by the NITAC and once the advice has been given, this is compiled uh, with a report from the Ministry of Health and the discussion with different stakeholders and forwarded to ICC, which is Interagency Coordinating Committee and the deciding body. And once a decision has been made about introduction, Ministry of Health conducts preparedness assessment and resource mobilization for planning and introduction. Next slide. So these are some of the challenges to decision-making process, and I will walk you through each one of them. Thank you. Next slide. So in terms of local data availability, lack of local data was reported as one of the major challenges in, in the study. That is their lack of absence of cancer registries in some of the countries, uh, which eventually de delayed the decision process because countries wanted to have local data to be able to decide about the vaccine. This also created difficulty for decision for the vaccine choice because there was no data available on serotype prevalence. Uh, HPV is an expensive vaccine and with the help of Gavi, many countries are able to uh, introduce the uh, HPV vaccination program in the country. However, major challenge is the cost drivers beyond vaccines, such as social mobilization, funding for training, and advocacy. Next slide. Another uh, challenge, another important challenge that was reported in the study was diversified ownership when international stakeholders approach different national stakeholders uh, to start the conversation and introduction. That creates competition on resources, competition on taking ownership, and resentment among stakeholders, eventually leading to difficult decision-making environment. Um, so a challenge with program placement as to where the HPV program could be placed, 
whether it would be National Cancer Control Program, EPI program, or dollars for health services. This also uh, created lack of coordination and delay in resource mobilization. Next slide, please. Uh, another important facilitating factor for age prioritization is political commitment. And that was seen across different programs, uh, local champions at the, uh, such as first ladies advocating for the program. Next slide, and I will hand it over to Dominique. Thank you, Nayab. So now I'm going to speak to challenges and facilitators to HPV vaccine introduction and scale up. Next slide, please. So here are some of the challenges and facilitators that we noted via our interviews, including financial considerations, programmatic considerations, vaccine acceptability, communications, and COVID-19 considerations. Next slide, please. So in regards to uh, financial considerations, vaccine pricing was mentioned to be a barrier amongst virtually all the stakeholders we interviewed. However, this has been less of a barrier due to the availability of GAVI funding. However, numerous stakeholders voiced difficulties with many countries meeting GAVI co-payments. Implementation costs were significant due to the target age group for HPV vaccines in which individuals, uh, specifically healthcare providers, had to go out into communities to deliver vaccines. So this, um, necessitated additional resource and capacity requirements. Financial sustainability was noted to be a key challenge, especially amongst GAVI transitioning countries. In regards to programmatic considerations, supply and demand challenges were key. In certain instances, they were more significant than funding. There has been insufficient supply to meet the global demand. These challenges were prevalent prior to COVID. However, they have significantly increased during COVID. There was also a mention of the possibility of local vaccine production in certain countries to overcome some of these challenges. Capacity infrastructure was also noted to be a key challenge as well, um, specifically considering school-based delivery platforms versus health facility platforms, and once again, considering um, inadequate human resources and considering what ideal delivery looks like when looking at the uh, infrastructure in many LMICs. Next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight this quote uh, from one of the stakeholders that we interviewed in Kenya. And this really speaks to the stigma behind cervical cancer, which influences introduction and also influences uptake. So uh, this stakeholder mentioned that when people talk about other uh, diseases such as measles, they tend to have an idea of what it is, but not necessarily for HPV. So you're starting off with a disease that has low awareness overall. And in addition, it's highly stigmatized um, due to uh, the sense of shame in it being a, genitals, uh, a genital cancer. So this tends to impact introduction and uptake. Next slide, please. So with that said, um, HPV vaccine acceptability, ex especially stigma, was noted at all levels in being a challenge to introduction. Um, and when I say all levels, I'm uh, referring to upstream stakeholders in addition to uh, downstream um, in regards to stigma being prevalent within communities at large. Um, as a result, there has been an avoidance of women uptaking prevention me uh, measures. In addition, uh, numerous stakeholders stated that um, is very challenging to increase acceptance for a disease that is stigmatized and that has a very slow uh, progression. So it tends to be relatively invisible. Vaccine hesitancy was noted to be a significant and in addressing vaccine acceptability, communications, advocacy and social mobilization were noted to be a key solution. Next slide, please. COVID-19 considerations were noted in regards to low prioritization, funding challenges, supply challenges and delivery and implementation challenges as well. Next slide, please. As far as recommendations, um, based off of the uh, responses that we elicited from our interviews, we recommend strengthening of data reporting systems, increasing stakeholder engagement across the board, health workforce mobilization, careful microplanning in country, involvement at the local level and making sure that decisions are locally driven, increased training for healthcare providers and more funding and heightened efforts for communications and social mobilization. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominique and Nayab. And it's great again to hear all the work that's been going on to better understand the policymaker landscape with regards to decision making and how we, how we can continue to further and think about how to introduce HPV, particularly with Innovax coming down the line. So thank you so much for that presentation. I believe we are ready for the next presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Danny Feiken. We'll talk about COVID-19 vaccination among the elderly. 
Good afternoon from Geneva. Uh, I work in the Department of Immunizations, Vaccines, and Biologicals at WHO. And today I'm going to move to the uh, opposite end of the life course, uh, the elderly, and I'm going to talk about COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide, please. Next. <clears throat> On the left side, you see the distribution of COVID cases globally. And you can see this bulge that occurs in uh, middle uh, adulthood. However, when you look at the distribution of deaths from COVID by age on the right, you see a, a very different uh, shape. You see an inverted pyramid. And that's because the majority of deaths from COVID have occurred among the elderly. In particular, two thirds of deaths have occurred in people over the age of 80. Next slide. What this shows you is the percentage of cases and deaths from COVID compared to the percentage of the total population by age group. For cases on the left, you see maybe a gradual increase in, the, in this ratio uh, over uh, by age. But on the right, clearly for deaths, you see that uh, the ratio of, of deaths to the general population increases among the elderly. And importantly, this is this occurs in all levels of income countries. It's not just a high income country phenomenon. Next slide. Let's look at coverage next. Uh, on the left, you see a map of uh, vaccine coverage with the primary series of COVID vaccination among the elderly. Green means high coverage, red, orange, and yellow mean low coverage. And immediately your eye is drawn to the the red uh, and yellow in Africa and some countries in Asia compared to high coverage in high income countries. At the bottom right, you can see globally, 73% of elderly persons have been given the primary series, but this is only 25% in Africa and 45% in the Eastern Mediterranean region, which is the Middle East. Next slide. So on the uh, y-axis, you see the percentage of elderly people who are vaccinated. On the x-axis is the percentage of the total population vaccinated. You can see that most countries lie above the green line, meaning that the coverage is higher among the elderly than the general population, as it should be, although there, were, there are a few outliers, and I'll be discussing one of them shortly. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna move on now to vaccine effectiveness. So this vaccine effectiveness is how these vaccines work in the real world. What I'm showing you here is a forest plot. Each dot represents a vaccine effectiveness estimate from a single study for a single vaccine. The uh, lines are the 95% confidence intervals and the colors represent the different vaccines shown at the bottom. So this is for Delta variant. And uh, at the top, in the top box, you see the results against severe disease. Most estimates are on the right side showing a vaccine effectiveness uh, estimate above 75% for multiple vaccines with a few outliers from this one study in Hungary where they have lower VE estimates. On the bottom, the outcome is any infection. And here you see that the VE tends to be lower it's in the 50 to 70% range for most vaccines. Again, with a few outliers, the outliers being two adenovirus vectored vaccines and an inactivated vaccines. Um, next slide. Now, if you give elderly people a booster dose, and all of the studies here have used mRNA booster doses, you see a, a significant increase in the vaccine effectiveness at the top for death and severe disease with blue representing Pfizer, you see vaccine effectiveness estimates above 90%. And it also increases above 75% for symptomatic disease and any infection. Next slide. Now let's look at Omicron. There are fewer studies that have looked at the overall vaccine effectiveness and only against severe disease. The three studies of mRNA vaccines show vaccine effectiveness above 80% against severe disease caused by Omicron. The two studies of the AstraZeneca adenovirus vectored vaccine show slightly lower VE estimates with wide confidence intervals. Next slide. 
if you give elderly people a booster, they do improve their vaccine effectiveness against Omicron, as you can see at the top for multiple vaccines, including in purple, an inactivated vaccine, the CoronaVac vaccine. Against symptomatic disease and any infection at the bottom, although the VE does improve after a booster, it does not get above 75%. It starts around 50 to 75%. Next slide. So what about the question of, does the vaccine effectiveness wane more quickly over time in the elderly? This is a study that we did with IVAC a couple months ago. This is pre-Omicron data. And at the top, what you see, uh, if we, let's look at the top left graph. These are studies that, that gave vaccine effectiveness estimates at multiple time points after vaccination. And um, what you can see in general is that there is a slight downward trend. We found a 10 percentage point drop um, over the first six months after vaccination. That's for all ages. At the bottom is for the elderly, and it was a 7.8 percentage point drop. So essentially the same. In the middle, you can look over time what happens against symptomatic disease, and the vaccine effectiveness drops more here by 27.8% in all ages, and at the bottom, 35.9% against uh, for the elderly with overlapping confidence intervals. And then on the far right against all, any infection, you see similar results to symptomatic disease, no difference by the age group. Next slide. So to summarize the VE uh, in the elderly, uh, the VE is higher against severe disease than against symptomatic disease and infection. The VE is higher for Delta than it is for Omicron. There is waning that occurs, particularly for symptomatic disease and infection, but it appears to be similar in the elderly to other age groups. And boosters do work to restore the VE in the elderly including against Omicron variant. Next slide. So this is a cautionary tale of what happened in Hong Kong. Uh, you probably read about this. They had a, a huge Omicron uh, wave there. And at the top left, you can see that most cases of mild disease occurred in young adults, whereas most severe and fatal cases occurred in people over 70. Well, what happened in Hong Kong? At the bottom right, you get some idea of what might be going on. Uh, in contrast to many other countries, vaccine coverage was much lower among the elderly, particularly among those 80 years of age and older, which is exactly the same group that suffers the greatest mortality. Uh, they felt that vaccines may be too strong for uh, elderly people to take. So that's why the coverage was low. Next slide. And then at the top left, you can see in the gray bar, most people who are unvaccinated in all age groups, including, uh, sorry, most fatal cases were unvaccinated uh, in all age groups, including the elderly. And then at the bottom right, you can see some of the VE estimates uh, for two vaccines, Pfizer and CoronaVac. The vaccines did work. The, the VE estimates were pretty high. The worst one was 60% for two doses of CoronaVac in those over 80, but 60% is pretty good. So in Hong Kong, the problem was not the vaccines, it was the vaccination. Next slide. So what's the future look like for COVID vaccines? This is the SAGE prioritization roadmap. Older people are in the highest priority group. And what this means is that uh, all older people should get the primary series. And once you reach moderate coverage with the primary series, you should then move on to giving boosters in the elderly, even before you give the primary series to those in lower risk groups. So primary series plus booster, at least one booster in the elderly. Next slide. Now, some countries have started to give two boosters. This is from Israel where they gave a fourth dose and you can see that there is a marginal increase by giving that fourth dose compared to people who got three doses, particularly for severe disease and death. But this is very short-term follow-up, less than a month. And then next slide. One of the problems with comparing with people who have three doses is you miss some of the story. This is a study from Canada looking at people comparing four doses to three doses. And it's an absolute vaccine effectiveness. So it compares to unvaccinated people. 
And if you look at the far right for severe outcomes, you'll see that there was an increase from two doses to three doses, but when you compare three doses with four doses, not much of an of a increase in the absolute VE, maybe 10%. So in the future, uh, for elderly people, we don't know for sure exactly where it's going to go, whether you will need multiple boosters, whether it might become a seasonal vaccine like influenza, which depends on the COVID epidemiology, or whether getting a couple boosters is enough because you do seem to have sustained protection against severe disease. And then I just want, next slide, I wanna thank some people. I uh, particularly wanna thank IVAC who do a ongoing systematic review of the VE literature and they publish it every week on ViewHub where you can find the latest and greatest in VE data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Very enlightening and, and great to hear. I think that is the question that we know that age is a predictor related to mortality. And so very interesting to hear how the recommendations are shifting and changing. And I think some issues on vaccine equity that I'm hoping we can, we can touch base on in the discussion. I'm going to move to our last presenter um, um, today, of today. And that is Laura from uh, the WHO who will focus on immunization agenda 2030, talking about the life course and integration approach. So over to you, Laura. Thank you, Rupali. Hello everybody, greetings also from Geneva. Um, I work also in the same department as Danny in the Immunization Vaccines and Biological Department, but I work in the Expanded Program and Immunization um, Unit or Essential Program of Immunization. So today we're going to talk about Immunization Agenda 2030 or IA 2030. And this aspect that we're going to talk on today is Strategic Priority 4. And I'm also the co-lead of the IA 2030 Working Group for Life Course Integration, along with my colleague um, Aaron Wallace from the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So next slide, please. So the Immunization Agenda 2030 is a new global vision for immunization over the next decade. And the vision for I2030 is a world where everyone, everywhere, at every age, fully benefits from vaccines for good health and well-being. And I2030 was actually endorsed last year by the World Health Assembly with the support of countries and partners. And the idea is that this agenda is going to address challenges over the next decade and save more than 50 million lives. So it's a very important uh, vision that we have. And I think particularly at the moment, there's a lot of um, need for people to really ensure that vaccines are, are provided and that everyone fully benefits from them in order to ensure that we have good health and well-being. Next slide. So IA2030 proposes a strategic framework, and within that there are seven strategic priorities. So these are shown on the right. So we have this immunization programs for uh, primary health care, universal health coverage. This is strategic priority one. And this kind of overarching theme or overarching priority encompasses commitment and demand, coverage and equity, life course integration, outbreak and emergencies, supply and sustainability, and research and innovation. So these are the seven strategic priorities, and these are informed by four core principles for action. And what we mean by that is we want to ensure that as strategic priorities are rolled out or implemented, that they are people-centered, country-owned, partnership-based, and data-guided. So these are kind of the, the view and uh, approach that we hope that countries will take as they look towards improving their immunization programs over the next decade. Next slide. So when it comes to life course integration, what do we mean by this? And I think a lot of people, um, they struggle with these terms because they're relatively new in some certain contexts, or they've been tried and tested in the past, particularly related to integration. But as part of IA2030, the goal of life course integration is to ensure that all people benefit from the recommended vaccines throughout the life course. That means over the course of their life, effectively integrated with other essential health services. So when we say effectively integrated with other health services, and that are essential health services, we mean that this is taking the people-centered approach. So when somebody comes for one particular service, that they may be able to avail of a package of services. So we're taking that people-centered approach, ensuring that people have access to, to multiple health, health interventions. And as part of the objectives of this goal or of this strategic priority, we want to ensure that we strengthen immunization policies and service delivery throughout the life course, including for appropriate capture vaccinations and booster doses. And I think it's very important at this moment in time that these, this particular strategic priority or objective is taken into consideration, given that we know that millions of 
Children and women have missed out on vaccines uh, throughout the course of the pandemic due to disruptions caused by the pandemic and closures of health facilities or hesitancy to access services during this time. So ensuring that people are caught up and receive the vaccines that they're missed uh, is really, really key. So that's really a key area that we're working on um, over the next couple of years, because if these people are not caught up, ultimately what we'll find is that we will have large scale outbreaks of many vaccine preventable diseases. Another objective is also to establish integrated delivery points of contact between immunization and other public health interventions for different target age groups. And this is an area that's also of particular interest at the moment. So many countries are thinking they're rolling out COVID-19 vaccination or they're scaling up rollout of COVID-19 vaccination. How can we reach these groups that haven't previously been reached before? So this is really an important aspect of ensuring that there is integrated delivery points and also that we don't just rely solely on immunization but also other health contacts to deliver immunization um, to, to those beyond target groups that we're usually typically used to seeing. Next slide. So here is just an example, I suppose, of how we, we look at the extent of life course vaccination. Now, I've shown here is the breadth of protection. So these are um, nice visuals that we develop as part of our um, WHO and UNICEF um, national immunization coverage estimates. So this is a, a breadth of protection indicator, which shows the global coverage that can be achieved for globally recommended antigens across multiple ages. So we have vaccines that are given from birth up until adolescence. And if you look at the year 2000, we can see that there really wasn't a, a great large scale amount of breadth of protection seen in, in, um, in these group age groups. However, when we look to 2020, we see that there has been an expansion in the breadth of protection but the increase has been more driven by introduction of vaccines rather than expanding use and coverage of the vaccines. What we mean by that is that really no real progress has been made in expanding vaccination coverage to un or underserved populations. So this means that you know, we still have a lot to do, but on the other side, those that have been reached have benefited from a wider portfolio of vaccines. And that's something that we hope to see happening more and more over the next decade. We want to see expansion of vaccines. We want to see increased coverage. And of course, we want to see an expansion of vaccines across the life course. Next slide. So here we see the life course approach to vaccination. This is a figure showing the different type of age-based platforms that can be established in order to deliver vaccines. So we have from pregnancy up to older persons, we have globally recommended vaccines that can be given. I think there's an animation in this slide, Andrew. Thanks. So we can see that for prior to COVID-19 vaccination, there really was only, um, there were no vaccines recommended for adult or older persons. So we can see that already we're seeing the extent of life course vaccination expanding. And it's very exciting to see that, you know, potentially what we're hoping to see is with the rollout of COVID-19 vaccination, the countries will begin to expand vaccination amongst their populations in adults and older persons. And this also, you know, not only does having these age-based platforms established help deliver vaccines, but also gives the opportunity to provide capture vaccination. So for example, if a child or an infant missed out on the uh, measles vaccine in the first year of life, that when that child comes for um, a contact in the second year of life, that child can be caught up and receive that measles vaccine. So that's a vision that we hope will be um, further expanded on in many countries and that this will require uh, many policy changes and expanding and integrating and working with other health programs as well. Next slide. So this is a, an expansion of the of the previous um, age-based platform. It's showing that by establishing these age-based platforms, it really helps to do you know, develop policies for integrated delivery. And this is critical to support a broader concept of the life course approach for health. And we know that in many countries already, there are many services already being co-delivered or integrated during immunization sessions. So we know that many children receive bed nets or may vi receive vitamin A during immunization sessions, but there are opportunities for more interventions to be delivered. And we need to think about how we can leverage better on that in order to provide that people-centered approach whereby people can receive more, vac more interventions than they typically would if they were to have a health facility visit. Next slide. So the vision for life course integration, we have key areas of focus we want to look at, and that includes increased stakeholder awareness. We want to ensure that we um, look at new people-centered delivery strategies and how that can happen in both health and non-health settings. We want to look at how we can reduce missed opportunities for vaccination, but also um, 
not just for vaccination, but also for other health interventions. The need for cross-sector collaboration is really, really key. We want to ensure that we can provide vaccines not only to children, but also to other uh, groups, including older adult health, private providers, et cetera. And also we want to see about, you know, how we can promote change to policy and financing so that people can deliver vaccines across the life course. And also the most important thing is we need to ensure that people can improve vaccination recording because we need to be able to track these vaccines that are given across the life course. Next slide. Finally, for the working group, as I mentioned, you know, we have some key deliverables that we're looking at. We want to ensure that we can contribute to regional guidance and recommendations in the life course integration and post vaccination. That means providing support so that countries can scale up life course and integration approaches. We also want to increase awareness about SP4 key focus areas. As I said, you know, it's, it's an area that many want to learn about, but you know, we want to ensure that the, the, some of the key areas are, are described, particularly around missed opportunities, delivery approaches and, and policy needs. And finally, we want to contribute to generating evidence on barriers and facilitators of the life course approach and integration strategy particularly using COVID-19 vaccine rollout as an opportunity to further the life course and integration agenda. And we hope that we can learn a lot from countries to see how they have been able to roll out COVID-19 vaccination and also if this has led to expansion of life course vaccination in their country. So thanks very much, everybody. That's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. That was a great way for us, I think, to cap off some really excellent presentations today um, across the life course. I would like to ask, there are several questions that have come in um, via chat and via Q&A and then separate messaging. So I'd like to go through some of those. Um, also, I want to welcome any other questions that individuals and attendees may have to put them in the Q&A or put them in the chat. We do have a few minutes for questions and we will do our best to try to get through uh, the questions that are asked. Um, so maybe I can just start with, with maternity internal immunization and a question um, that came in. One of, it seems like from your findings that there is a need to think about the ways in which we can support healthcare workers and immunizers in navigating difficult vaccine conversations with their pregnant clients. I wondered, Alicia and Paul, if there was anything that you learned from your formative work in Kenya that could speak to this. Absolutely, thank you, Polly. Um, I would say it was really interesting to learn um, that in this time of uh, misinformation and constantly uh, getting new evidence on uh, the COVID vaccine, um, that not only was the general public um, experiencing some confusion, um, but also the healthcare workers. Um, and this really did come across in our results. Um, and so one of the recommendations that we are suggesting is to really focus on training healthcare workers um, both on um, information and addressing those needs of answering their questions about the COVID vaccine and the safety, um, but also on interpersonal communication and on how to facilitate really meaningful um, and uh, effective conversations with their patients so that trust is built between both the healthcare worker and the client. Um, and so uh, questions are being answered um, across both um, parties as well. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. Um, I think understanding and making sure, because we are seeing hesitancy in healthcare workers, which you rightly pointed out from this work is a, is a critical piece of this. Um, I wanna tag over to Laura. I just want to add on to the point that Alicia made about building trust. I think maternal immunization is an area that sometimes is often neglected, unfortunately, but it's a really critical point, um, particularly as many mothers, it's the pathway to health. And what we're finding is that if a mother has a poor experience during maternal immunization, then she may be more unlikely to bring her child for a vac first vaccination. So I think it's, a, it's an area that like trust does need to be really, really considered and, and, and built on and um, because the implications for childhood vaccination can be greatly impacted by this experience. Such an important point to make, Laura, that it is very predictive of future vaccination, including pediatrics. So thank you for making that point. Uh, the next question that came in is related to the HPV presentation. Um, I think in, it's in one of your findings in your slides, um, Nayab and Dominique, you spoke about this issue of prioritization at the country level. I'm curious if you can comment on this, given that countries are also trying to figure out how to incorporate 
COVAX and COVID into their already limited budgets related to vaccination? And what are some key things that we can take away from these stakeholder interviews that you have done of how to really think about and nudge countries related to prioritizing HPV? Nayab, I wasn't sure if you wanted to go ahead and no, answer. No, you can go ahead. You can go um, ahead. I think that was one of the uh, one of the key um, factors that we really noticed with our interviews because there was this emphasis in that at in certain time points, especially in many countries, um, decisions aren't locally driven. Um, there's this constant nudging and this constant messaging of vaccine introduction being a locally driven process. However, we realize that that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so it's multifactorial and it, it can be relatively complex when considering, um, you know, not just the key decision makers, but also um, how to really ensure that um, uh, introduction and decisions are locally driven. And so um, there was this uh, notion of that, um, given the complex uh, health priorities within many countries, you know, um, how do we effectively introduce HPV vaccines, but making sure that it meets um, country priorities, given that there are so many other disease burdens. So it was it was pretty interesting to note that even though there's this messaging of locally driven processes, it tends not to be locally driven overall. Thank you so much um, for that, Dominique. I think that's a really good point with regards to the structure and the function of this work of thinking about how do we make it locally driven, but what are the realities really on the ground, right, is, is what you all are saying with regards to HPV. Maybe I can turn over to Danny next and, you know, focusing on the elderly population. So a question that came in um, that I was hoping that we could touch base on. And then I have a question for all the panelists after a question for Laura. I'm just curious, Danny, you made a comment um, related to vaccinating the elderly and how coverage was quite a bit lower when you look at Africa as well as Middle East. I'm curious if you can comment on equity and what is the issue with regards to access to vaccines in, in, ge in these geographical locations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so clearly, um, when vaccines first became available, there was, there was a huge gap in, in availability. Um, and we saw high income countries forging ahead with, with coverage, whereas as many of the countries in Africa and South Asia were barely getting off the ground. It, it did take COVAX some time. Um, COVAX, for those of you who don't know, is the mechanism where, where um, purchasing is bundled together for, for uh, some of the, the lowest income countries and vaccines are delivered to those countries. It took them some time to kind of get every all the pieces together. Uh, we're now in a situation where even though coverage is lower in those places, it's shifted from a supply side issue to more of a, a absorptive capacity issue and a demand issue. There are enough vaccines but uh, it's, it's still hard to get up to uh, the coverage levels. Um, and now we're seeing countries, high income countries giving the fourth dose where many of these countries are still struggling to, to cover the high risk populations with the primary series. So I think that needs to be the focus in, in places like Africa is, is really covering like the elderly and high risk people with, with the basic primary series. Thank you so much, Danny. I mean, it's so interesting that you raised this issue of demand, which we also heard from the maternal team, right? That even though supply is there, that doesn't mean if you build it, they will come. There has to be a way and there has to be community mobilization that occurs. So people are excited and interested in getting the vaccine. Maybe I can switch over to Laura for one specific question related to her presentation. And then I have a question that I think applies to every presentation that we have heard today. Um, so Laura, a question that we came in um, was how can we uh, strategically and intentionally incorporate people-centered strategies that are sustainable as well as rigorous thinking through this IA 2030 lens? So if you don't mind commenting on that. Yeah, I think, you know, when we think about how to uh, make a, a more people-centered approach, we think of primary health care and having an integrated primary health care. What we see at the moment is there's a lot of fragmentation happening in the different program areas where 
you come from one service, then you have to go to another place for another service and another place for another service. Even in some countries, you have to, you know, I've seen it in one place where you have to go down the road to another health center and you'd want to have a pretty, you know, determined and committed person to think about, oh, I'm going to leave this health facility and go to another one and queue for another couple of hours. So I think um, the way we need to think about this is having a more integrated approach. And uh, that means that, you know, a lot of the funding structures we have you know, in terms of what's available from global funders, you know, flexibility and allowing countries to align some of their funding so that they can co-deliver vaccines and other health interventions. And also um, for the work that we do on, on immunization, a lot of people criticize immunization programs for being very vertical, but actually, in fact, when we see with the work that we do on missed opportunities for vaccination, we see that when children come for other health interventions, they don't get screened or referred for vaccination. Whereas in an immunization visit, they may receive vitamin A or deworming or, you know, so, so I think it's, it's going to really require a more primary healthcare approach and um, where we think about how we can work together more and think about what services are, are appropriate and touching on the point about demand. When you think people centered, you have to ensure that you, know, you take that country context into consideration. You don't put certain interventions together that may actually deter people from coming to the health facility. So we've seen that happen in some countries where they may have offered a certain service, um, such as family planning, which may not be um, you know, something that is recognized or approved by the community. And then it has seen people actually turning away from services. So having the demand and um, having appropriate um, services in place and people centered, meaning that you, you listen to what the people want and then try and deliver them and making sure they're available. Because you can't promise that you're going to have a package of services and then when people come, they're not all there. So that's kind of the idea, how we can try and make it more rigorous and sustainable. And hopefully by doing that, you can increase coverage of all the interventions, not just immunization. Thank you so much, Laura. I think it's such an interesting point to think about integration and sort of does it flow both ways to your point. In other visits, is immunization promoted and vice versa in immunization, what is promoted and what are ways that we can strengthen that relationship? So that's a really good point. Um, I believe one person has their hand raised and so maybe I can ask this individual, Kim Woodruff, to unmute and ask your question. Okay, I will. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see if we can, if we can hear uh, Kim. If you are able to unmute, please go ahead. Um, I'm so sorry. I raised my hand by mistake. Please ignore that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Okay. No problem. Well, I have, I have one more question that I would like to ask, and I'm hoping that each of you can quickly comment on this in our last two minutes. Um, several presenters mentioned the role of stigma with regards to uptake of vaccines in different groups of people. Can you comment on what are the different types of solutions are needed for different groups? Or do you think that there are sort of baseline ways to respond to stigma that would benefit all populations, regardless of where they are in the life course or what antigen we're speaking about? So I think if each of you can comment, I'll start with Nayab since she has her hand raised. Thank you, just one thing common and I think for so when it comes to solution what because for each of the vaccine and I would uh, speak more specifically about HPV vaccine it has been there for a quite number of years so the solution could be to to incorporate the the rumors or all the conversation around stigma in the communication material that is being for energy mobilization the communication material should be tailored accordingly to tackle the misinformation thank you nayab so making sure that we are identifying misinformation and we're tackling misinformation in in communication maybe i can turn it over um, to to danny next to comment on this oh and i think you are on mute on mute i am on uh, unmuted now uh, i guess i would say it's both. I think, I think there are, are general concerns that would bridge across vaccines uh, and place, such as lack of awareness of, of disease burden and um, in places that don't understand the disease or the disease is delayed like HPV and cervical cancer. Um, there's a general perception, why, why get vaccinated? Because the disease isn't, isn't prevalent around where I am. Um, I think there's suspicion of institutions that and, and organizations and manufacturers that may sort of cut across vaccine. I'd say that 
a general category, I think probably the, the biggest category is, is fear of, of adverse events uh, from vaccination. But I think that takes a different manifestation based on the age group and the antigen. So for example, for young kids, there's fear of autism. For maybe young girls with HPV, there's fear of infertility from the vaccine. For, for elderly people, like I mentioned in Hong Kong, maybe there's a perception like their immune system's too weak to get the vaccine. So I think there could be general categories of concerns, but the specifics will vary depending on antigen and population. Thank you so much, Danny. Curious if Laura or Paul or Alicia have a quick comment. We are at time, but I just wanna make sure you all have a moment to chime in. Let me go quickly. I think it's uh, also a question of where does the stigma arise? Um, and sometimes it's for the, from the people who matter to clients. And therefore the messaging I think should target uh, people like gatekeepers, we may call them that, but also um, the clients might hold the government in suspicion. So it's important also the government really uh, communicate very clearly the intention uh, of vaccination to, to appear that there is nothing actually being hidden. The targeting these gatekeepers really early on and not just the other workers, including um, people who really matter to clients, will really be helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Very much appreciate that. Um, I want to think we are we are at time. I just want to be cognizant. So a, a few things. Um, this recording will be available on our website in a few days, and we will send a link to all participants and panelists. I want to very, very much thank the panelists for coming together this morning, afternoon, evening. We were able to, in one hour, focus on maternal immunization, switch to adolescent immunization, talk about elderly immunization, and then talk about the life course as a whole. So I very very much appreciate everyone coming. I want to thank the attendees for attending this conference as well. So thank you to everyone. Um, have a great day. And as I mentioned, we will send out the recorded presentation once it is available. Thank you very much, everyone.